Good afternoon, everyone. We are back with the Rangers Thursday lunchtime series again, talking about navigating dry conditions and and high prices. Uh, we'll do some. Uh, I may have to introduce Dr. Lawman. Dr. Lawman's having a few technical difficulties at the moment. Uh, maybe we'll get those resolved. But I'm Rosalind Biggs. I'm a beef cattle extension specialist, uh, veterinarian, and housed within the College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Beck. I'm Paul Beck. I'm a beef cattle extension specialist focusing on uh, nutrition of growing and finishing cattle. David Lawman. Uh, I also have a split extension and research appointment, mostly cow calf uh, nutrition management. Pleasure you to uh, join us here today as we go spend the day talking about uh, cool season or sorry, warm season annuals. And these two guys are experts in that area. Hope you'll join us next week uh, with Mr. James Henderson from the Bradley Three Ranch. He is going to talk about selecting cows to get along well, thrive and survive in tough conditions. Uh, that operation, they've been doing that for a long time. All right, thanks, Dr. Lawman. Well, we've got uh, a good, good attendance uh, already joined us. Uh, we do recognize last week we had a few folks that ran into some technical difficulties. And so I'm going to assume if you're hearing me say this, that you're online today. But if that happens to you in the future, you're certainly welcome to send any of us an email and we'll try to get that corrected. We did bring in IT uh, on standby today to make sure if we run into any folks, and I know Dr. Lawman's probably monitoring his email and, and the phone uh, just in case we run into. So we apologize for that. I'm not certain on the details, but um, if you run into problems again at any time, uh, you're certainly welcome to contact us. We'll try to try to get that resolved as we can, but always remember they are recorded too. And uh, our sessions are available on beef.okstate.edu. So uh, with that, I think let's get down to the, to the good stuff. Uh, Dr. Paul Beck is up first and Dr. Beck, I will ask you to, to share your screen and then we'll get rolling. Thank you, Dr. Biggs. Also joining us today is, is James Rogers. He's a extension forage specialist from North Dakota State University. Um, very excited to have him on. Um, he's been a close colleague and coworker for uh, many years. And uh, most of you in Oklahoma are familiar with him from his time at the Noble uh, Foundation and the Noble Research Institute. So. Uh, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak first and then let him follow up and correct anything that I uh, uh, misstate. So with that, we'll, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and, and we'll uh, get started and move from there. So uh, we've had quite a few calls um, since we started advertising this, this session about uh, a lot of the aspects of, of growing these, there's a lot of people with a uh, tremendous amount of experience uh, growing these warm season annuals, uh, but there's still quite a few questions that come about as far as the, uh, the best practices. And I'm going to talk about some of my experiences in growing these and harvesting these and the qualities we, we see. Uh, and then James, uh, Dr. Rogers is going to take a deeper dive in, into a a lot of the other aspects of, of growing warm season annuals uh, to help restore our, our uh, hang inventory. Um, one of the, the gold standards or, or what most of us are uh, very familiar with would be crabgrass. Uh, we, you know, a lot of times use this as either a haying or a, a grazing crop. Um, it, you know, one of the, the aspects of, of crabgrass that we know as far as uh, hay production is it makes a very ugly hay. Uh, you know, those bales are squatty. Uh, a lot of times their, their color is, is uh, off a little bit or it's browning, um, hard to dry. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that go against crabgrass hay, but it makes a very uh, good quality hay product. Uh, here's some research that we've conducted looking at the harvest interval between um, uh, harvests, um, increasing the maturity of this. And if we look at Bermuda grass, if we go from 21 day 
a harvest interval up to 49 days, we see a, a huge decrease, you know, from, uh, you know, upper, you know, teens, mid teens in crude protein down to, you know, below 10% uh, uh, crude protein. Uh, digestibility may go down from uh, low to upper uh, uh, 60s in TDN down to, to below 50. And as we, you know, we've seen with, with a lot of research with crabgrass and looking at uh, increasing uh, harvest interval or increasing maturity at harvest, it doesn't decline in quality quite as rapidly as what we expect with Bermuda grass. So a lot of those rules of thumb that we have uh, to, you know, for Bermuda grass where we want to look at a, uh, 28 to 35 day uh, harvest interval um, doesn't really always necessarily follow through with crabgrass. Uh, we went from uh, stem elongation on 21 days where we're yielding about uh, 3,000 pounds of dry matter per, per acre. Um, when waited two weeks to, to go to 35 days, uh, we had over uh, 7,000 pounds of dry matter per acre waited another two weeks to get out to 49 days and we got nearly 10,000 pounds of, of forage dry matter accumulation. Um, you know, we did see a decline in, in uh, crude protein from about 15 down to 14 with, with the 35 day harvest and then down to 11% uh, crude protein at 49. Um, fibers increased, but not as, uh, uh, Large of increase is what we expect, which goes back into our total digestible nutrients or the digestibility of that going from about 63% down to about 55% uh, TDN. So with this, you know, it's a, you know, even if we wait and get that uh, 3x increase in dry matter yield by waiting, you know, the extra uh, 35 uh, 28 days from 21 days to out to 49 days, you know, that hay would still meet a cow's nutrient requirements uh, as far as energy goes for uh, late just late lactation um, and would meet the crude protein requirements of a cow even in, in a, a peak milk. So fairly good quality hay, even though it may not be the most uh, attractive hay product. The problem with crabgrass is it's it's very dependent on rainfall. And uh, as we've seen in our last couple of years of drought, if we've been relying on crabgrass to reseed, we haven't seen as much production out of those uh, reseeding annuals uh, like the crabgrass whenever we're, we're in this drought. So, you know, warm season annuals, when we start looking at Sudan grasses and, and others, it's you know, historically used mostly as an uh, emergency crop for hay. Um, there has been a lot of cover crops that have creeped up. So um, uh, Dr. Rogers has a lot of experience with, with using these complex blends or, or cover crop blends um, for haying or, or grazing. But, uh, you know, they, they do have a lot of uh, positive qualities as far as the or, or uh, agronomic benefits, um, but they haven't been selected for those mixes for grazing. Um, and many of the species that are included haven't really been tested for quality grazing preference or, or any of that. But many of them do make very good uh, forage crops. And I, whenever we're grazing these, just to kind of get out of, uh, you know, off from my topic a little bit, but, you know, if we're grazing those types of products, I just use that same rule of thumb that we would for grazing millets and Sudan grasses, where we want to start our grazing, you know, at 18 to 36 inches and then leave a six to eight inch stubble height so it will regrow. Um, but, you know, with all of these, the rapid growth habit and uneven growth habit of a lot of these different species make it a little bit difficult to, to manage grazing. Uh, here's a Example of some uh, su uh, sorghum Sudan grass that we had uh, planted in some some pastures in 
southwest Arkansas. Uh, pretty good mix of both our intended crop and some crabgrass that, that grew up in there, um, but highly productive uh, type of, of forages. And you know, a lot of these, uh, as an example, when we're looking at iron clay cowpea is something that would be grown in a mix um, with these and, and has been for, for many years. Um, by the time we're um, out to uh, week nine, this may be where you would want to harvest this uh, uh, forage crop. But when we look at uh, the sorghum Sudan that's growing in, in the same location in this small plot test, you know, we're really wanting to, to start grazing that around week, week four. Uh, for sure, want to get that harvested by that by day 42 after planting, so or after emergence. And, you know, so if we, we look at that, the timing for that cowpea may not be the same as the timing for the, the sedan grass. So that, that anytime you have mixtures, that does complicate factors. Uh, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is the brown midrib trait. And it's a, um, genetic mutation that decreases the amount of lignification of our fiber or decreases the lignin uh, that goes into the ADF. So it decreases the, the fiber content, increases the, the digestibility of the fiber. Um, but with that, there's uh, often been talk of a yield drag, that there's a decrease in yield with a lot of our um, brown midrib varieties. So we had planted uh, three different varieties. The Sweet Sunny Sioux is a standard variety. Um, it's got the, the box with the solid line, and here's the yield over uh, time with the days after planting uh, and our dry matter yield per acre. Uh, the Nutra Plus BMR is uh, somewhat related to the Sweet Sunny Sioux, uh, but it's a selection from that and across of, of some other uh, genetic stock with the brown midrib gene. And then we have the MS505. It's a dry stock variety that we're interested in looking at that would have a drier stock and make it easier to, to dry down. So comparing that Sweet Sunny Sioux and the, the other two varieties, yes, if we look at the days after planting, um, we do see that yield drag that, that a, a lot of people bring up and, and that uh, starts out to be fairly small whenever the, the plants are immature, uh, but then gets bigger as, uh, with time. Um, but whenever we look at the maturity, uh, and here's just a maturity score of these different forages. So at a 30, we're looking at uh, three different, three nodes. Um, when we get up to uh, right at 50, uh, in, in the 50s, it's the early uh, boot stage uh, going into heading as, as we uh, get above 50. And then uh, once we're up into the the 60s, it's it's the seed formation. So, you know, the sweet sunny sue or the standard variety uh, was just uh, more mature at each different harvest date. Uh, whenever we compare that to our Nutra Plus or the BMR varieties uh, in this test, so whenever we expressed the yield at equal maturity, uh, you know, with our target harvest at a, a early heading or, or late boot stage would be that 55. Um, when we look at that, that would be on day 63 for the brown midrib varieties um, and day 55 for our non-brown midrib variety. Um, we see a substantial uh, increase in yield whenever we compare that at equal maturity. Uh, a lot of our forages tests, you know, they're so big, they can't, they have to harvest them on a certain day. So that's when those comparisons are made. Um, but if we're looking at harvesting at a certain maturity, you know, those brown midrib varieties really don't have that yield drag 
uh, whenever we uh, harvest on maturity uh, uh, rather than harvesting on, on a certain date. When we look at crude protein, the, uh, this is the percent of, of dry matter and crude protein of these three different varieties. Um, the uh, brown midrib varieties are, uh, when we get out there to day 55 to 63, are, uh, have more protein uh, than the uh, standard variety. Um, but, you know, I have the uh, orange line is, is the nutrient requirements for a uh, pig milk lactating cow. The red line is the protein requirements of a uh, dry pregnant cow. And, you know, whenever we get out to the hay harvest timing for these, um, they're going to be lower in protein uh, than our cow's nutrient requirements. So, they're, you know, protein is not why we, we're harvesting these. Uh, we're, we're actually trying to get energy and, and uh, dry matter to, to feed to these cows. And we're going to have to pro uh, supplement protein uh, at most times whenever we're harvesting these. Um, whenever we look at the days after planting, um, the brown midrib in this red line, it was uh, uh, significantly higher uh, in TDN than our standard variety at, at all harvest dates. And, and when we, even when we compare uh, day 55, which would be early heading for that uh, standard variety, it's right there about 60. And we're close to about 62. Uh, by day 63 or that early heading. So uh, when we're looking at maturity, you know, the quality um, actually comes to be uh, more increased in those brown midribs as we get more advanced in maturity because all of them are putting on more fiber and, and the fiber digestibility differences. This is another study where we followed up on that previous one, and this is looking at a Sudan grass hybrid. Um, and the Hague King is a brown midrib that, that uh, was getting quite a bit of uh, advertisement and use. Uh, the Piper is a standard variety, non-brown midrib that um, was has been popular for a long, long time. It's been used for, for years and years. Um, when we harvested those at the boot stage, they were essentially the same in, in uh, uh, dry matter yield, um, maybe even a little bit higher in crude protein uh, for that standard variety. Um, but when we're at the boot stage, we we're still right at three and a half percent more digestible uh, for that brown midrib uh, than the non-brown midrib, midrib variety. Um, when we look at the dose stage, what happened here is we started getting quite a bit of rainfall, um, which I hope we have this problem uh, in the summer this year. Um, but our standard variety, the, the old go-to Piper uh, sedan grass variety, started getting a lot of rust uh, issues within it. So its yield was, was actually uh, decreased over, over that time. And, you know, the hay king was not, uh, affected by that rust in, in the stand. Um, so we doubled our yield by the time we went from boot to doe going from 10,000 uh, pounds up to 20,000 pounds of forage dry matter. We're in that, uh, Piper, uh, we went from 10,000 pounds just up to about 13,000 pounds. Uh, the same kind of decrease in crude protein that we'd uh, seen in, in, in other trials as we advance in maturity, um, but also a, a very nice retention of, of uh, TDN going from a, a fairly immature uh, plant up to a plant that's nearing maturity with the dose stage seed. Uh, and only going from 56 down to about 55% TDN um, compared to uh, 52 versus 50 with that Piper variety. So uh, similar decrease in, in uh, 
TDN or digestibility, but it actually just started at a, a quite a bit lower uh, digestibility. We've also had quite a bit of discussions about TEF, and this is a, a fairly new um, uh, forage coming into to our, our area. Uh, TEF is a uh, actually a, a relative of lovegrass. It comes from Ethiopia. In our area, it is an annual. Um, it's got some issues as far as uh, uh, root development and rooting down, so um, not the best grazing variety as far as early grazing, but it does make a, a very attractive hay product and, and a very high quality hay product. Um, here's some pictures that uh, uh, Joel Reagan from Berenberg Seed sent to me, and um, you know this is 21 days, um, 35 days, and and then. Uh, up to about 40 some days here uh, in, in, uh, after planting. And here it is once, when it's starting to mature. And, and it does regrow quite rapidly after, after haying. So uh, it's, if we can cut it at a high enough level, just like any of these warm season annuals, we can keep our cutter bar up to about uh, you know, four inches or a little bit higher. Uh, we should expect quite a bit of regrowth to get a second harvest on a lot of these. Some of the research. Um, that I found with the teff grass, uh, this is on some irrigated uh, uh, teff plots out of Utah. Um, you know, without fertilizer, we expect about, you know, at one ton per harvest with a, uh, you know, seven or eight percent crude protein level. Um, as they increase nitrogen fertilization, uh, this would 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre per harvest. Uh, this would be a 50 pound total per, for the summer. You know, we're looking at about four tons of, of dry matter uh, production uh, with a 10 percent crude protein. And, and it responds to, to nitrogen fertilization like we do expect with a lot of our forage crops. You know, the, the 100 pounds of total nitrogen per acre, we still get a very nice uh, yield response. Uh, and that yield response kind of slows down as we increase the nitrogen fertilization. Uh, but we have an increase in, in crude protein uh, as we would normally expect as we add more nitrogen fertilizer. Um, here's another one that uh, research trial that came out of Idaho. Um, 53 days from uh, planting to harvest at the boot stage, they got about 2,500 pounds of dry matter per acre, uh, a ton and a half per acre on that. It was an 18% crude protein and 56% TDN. And in this, they did not uh, apply any nitrogen fertilizer um, and just let it scavenge leftover fertilizer uh, from the previous crop. Um, even though they did have a soil test saying that it would need about 56 pounds uh, of added nitrogen fertilizer for the production. Uh, going out to early head, only uh, when one week in, in added harvest days, we increased by about a thousand pound per acre. Uh, hay yield was, was about two tons per acre. Uh, when we add our dry matter back in. And our uh, 66 days, our, our late heading, uh, we got up to 4,600 pounds of, of yield per uh, acre. Um, did lose protein down from 18% down to 12%, but that's still adequate for most of our, our growing calves or, or lactating cows. And what's interesting is the TDN or total digestible nutrients increased at the boot stage from 56 up to 59 when we added uh, cutting, cutting interval or increased in maturity, which is not something we expect to see. So just a real brief planting guide. This has been brought up and, and, and asked, um, you know, the, if we're going to drill, we can get by with uh, much less 
or much lower seeding rates. Um, when we're looking at uh, sorghum or sorghum sedan grasses, you know, their recommended drilling rate is about 20 to 25. Uh, it's a smaller seed. Uh, broadcast will go up to 30 to 40 pounds. If we look at a more of a sorghum or something that's shaped in about the size of a milo, we're looking at uh, four to six pounds in wider rows or 15 to 20 when we broadcast. Uh, pearl millet is another uh, really good um, choice for a lot of these production systems. We're looking, they're much smaller seeds, so we're looking at eight to 10 pounds per acre. Uh, and the teff, we're looking at only about eight to 10 pounds per acre. Uh, crabgrass, we would look at four to six pounds of acre per acre, and most of that is uh, broadcast in, in my past experience. The pearl millet uh, and teff are very small seeds, so we really need to uh, calibrate your drill and make sure that your seeding rate is what you're wanting. If you have it off by a little bit, you can, you know, have five, 10 times more seed put go out than what you intend. Also, the seeding depth is, is gets to be more and more important as we uh, get into the smaller size seeds. Pearl millet, we need to keep between a half and three quarter of an inch. Teff, it's a small enough seed we really need to have about one eighth inch of uh, seed depth and you're not gonna be able to put it into the moisture whenever you're doing that. So it's gonna require rain to get it to start growing, even though it is one of the more water use efficient types of crops. Uh, prussic acid is an issue in sorghum and sorghum sedan grass. It's not so much an issue in pearl millet, uh, not an issue in teff. Uh, or crabgrass. Uh, nitrates are an issue in the sorghums, the sedan grasses, and the millets. Um, they say it's not an issue in teff, but I have uh, talked to some producers that said they had some uh, nitrates uh, accumulate in teff last year. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind as you're planning your fertilizer fertilization. Uh, crabgrass is not usually. Uh, considered a, a nitrate accumulator, uh, but it has been known to in the past. Um, I wanted to give an example. Uh, prices on, on the uh, Sudan grasses, the Piper, I priced out at $75 per bag. On the Brown Midrib, it's about $108 per bag. Um, by the time you, uh, you know, put out 20, 25 pounds per bag, you're still investing 37 to, to $50. In seed cost alone, if we harvested that at the boot stage, we're looking at seven to $10 per ton of dry matter just for the seed. Uh, whenever we look at the TDN uh, content, um, we're looking at 13 to $18 per ton just in seed cost per ton of, of TDN. But when we're uh, supplementing a, a lactating cow, it would take a dollar fifty six uh, in cost to meet a cow's uh, needs, which a dollar forty five of that would be uh, for supplement based on seven dollar per bushel corn and five hundred dollar per ton soybean meal, um, which is ninety dollars per ton of hay um, compared to a much lower supplement requirement for the BMR, uh, dollar and a nickel per day just for a supplement, which is about $63 per ton of the hay. So even though it's cheaper and the yield at the boot stage is about the same and the quality is, is fairly good, you know, it's gonna take a lot more supplement to meet those cow needs. Uh, if we go all the way to the dough stage, we're uh, doubling, or, or adding about 7,000 pounds more in yield in this one trial, um, we're decreasing our total cost, uh, seed cost per ton of dry matter uh, and, and de decreasing the, the TDN uh, cost of that, even though we're paying a considerable amount more for that seed. So 
with that, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to, to share this. And if we have any questions, I can address a few or we can uh, just move on and let James uh, present. Just as a reminder for our audience today, you're welcome to put those questions in the chat or in the Q&A, whichever suits you best. Uh, I don't see any questions right now, Dr. Beck. We might reserve a little bit more time at the very end because uh, I anticipate we might get, get a few in between now and then. Excellent. So I'm gonna introduce Dr. James Rogers. He uh, is, uh, I got to know him whenever he came to Noble Foundation several years ago. Uh, worked with him over the years, uh, presented in different meetings with him over the years. And he is actually one of the, he's a well-trained animal scientist. He's got two degrees in animal science and, and then a PhD in uh, agronomy. So that sets him up to, to be one of the, the best trained uh, uh, scientists in our, in our realm. So um, with that, James, I'm gonna, uh, let you take over and really appreciate you being here for us. Thanks, Paul. I hope I can live up to that introduction. I really appreciate it. Okay, can you see my slides? Yes, sir, they're coming through. Okay. Uh, so Paul did a, an excellent job. It's gonna to be tough to, to follow up on what Paul, Paul had to say. I, I do have a, a little bit uh, different take on, on uh, the use of um, annuals for, for hay production. And it's kind of interesting here in, in North Dakota, I look out my window and we've got snow on the ground and I think it was uh, 12 degrees when I came into to work this morning. So there's about a, a good month difference or maybe a little bit more in the, in the growing season between here and, and North Dakota. So even right now in Oklahoma, you have opportunities to, to get some things in the ground and, and get your season started. But it's also interesting, when I was in Oklahoma, I, I spent a lot of my years there dealing with drought, either prolonged types of drought or uh, flash droughts. And moving to North Dakota, I, I'm moving to an even drier environment than I was in, in Oklahoma. Where I was in Oklahoma, we had on average 36 inches of rainfall, but we lost a lot of that during the summer just to heat and evapotranspiration. Here in North Dakota, I'm in a 18 inch, 14 to 18 inch rainfall zone, but uh, because of the differences in temperature, that, that moisture seems to go a whole lot longer or further along than it did in Oklahoma. So we'll, we'll go through and I'll share some of the experiences that I've had in, in Oklahoma. So, so what I wanna do is kind of think about some initial considerations dealing with uh, dry weather, dealing with forage management in Oklahoma. And some of the options that you that I see that you do have, Paul, Paul already covered some of those. We'll look at some of the minor crops and some of the uh, lesser options I think you might have. And then some of the major crops, some of the big high horsepower crops that I think you do have opportunities for. And then we'll wind up with a little bit of discussion down there, uh, discussion there as well. So one of the things in dealing with drought and dealing with hay supplies and restoring hay supplies has to do with your management prior to these drought events and even after during those drought events. And this, this goes back to the recovery of the, of the droughts of the 1950s in Texas. B.A. Young, he was responding to the damage that was a result of those uh, five-year period of drought from 49 to 54. He's talking about the ability of those rangelands to, to recover. And it can be correlated with land management, the type of soil, we know that. And in general, ranges that were properly managed before and during the drought came through in fairly good condition. 
overstock ranges were severely damaged and recovery was limited. So here's his message. Ranchmen have evidence of the need for carrying out proper management practices year after year, not only to meet drought periods, but to build for an economic unit by capitalizing on the years of favorable moisture. Thus the old rule of thumb still prevails that close grazing does not pay. So the message there is that always practice good grazing management on your introduced and your range uh, pastures because it's just an insurance policy because we know that you're living in a fairly fragile environment that at some point in time, even if you're living in times of, of uh, good moisture and good growing conditions, drought's going to return. And the better you manage those forage resources prior to that drought and going into the drought, the more easily you're gonna be able to recover from those, from those drought periods. One of the things to, uh, to think about is if you're, if you're in, say, a, a winter pasture situation where you're running stocker cattle and you have winter pasture uh, acres or cropland acres, know your land, know, th know that resource and what potentially you can get out from maybe a volunteer crop. Um, this is an example here at the Noble Research Center or Institute where I was at for several years where we were looking at introducing a, a, a diverse cover, summer cover crop into a winter pasture system. And the image here on the right is, is my control check. So we were trying to keep that chemically fallow throughout the summer. But you can see here a lot of volunteer forage mass that we were spraying out. <clears throat> So this area, we had a lot of, of crabgrass seed had been put out over the years. So this was really a mixture of crabgrass, uh, broadly signal grass, all of which would have been very high quality forage if we had allowed it to go and, and graze that. So over here on the left is the, is the cover crop that we were actually no-tilling into this area. So the, the point here is that if, if you know what possibly can volunteer, you might be able to take advantage of those volunteer crops. Paul did a great job of talking about maturity. Uh, this is just another, another slide that's just backing up what Paul said. <clears throat> and here, I just wanna point out uh, sorghum Sudan crass at vegetative versus heading. And this would just be a non uh, BMR, standard check sorghum Sudan grass, and just looking at the difference in, in quality between vegetative and heading and that maturity effect here. We have a drop in protein, we have an increase in our fiber content and a decrease in our energy content. And another thing, a point that I like to make is with an increase in fiber content, you also have a decrease in the amount of voluntary dry matter intake that those animals can process on a per head per day basis. So a point I like to make with, with our producers is the quality of that forage is not gonna improve post-harvest. The best it's ever gonna be is when you take that cutter to the field and lay it down into a windrow, that's the best it can ever be. But there's a lot of things that you can do between the point that you cut it down and roll it up into a bale that can decrease the quality of that hay product. <clears throat> garbage in is always gonna be garbage out. And Paul talked about plant maturity. All our plants are gonna go through these three phases of reproductive development, where during the vegetative stage, they're gonna be the highest in, in quality. And as we go through uh, the phases of reproduction, they're gonna lose quality, increase in fiber, and we may also get an increase in yield but this is really gonna vary based on plant species and maybe some of the traits that, that that individual plant species may contain. Moisture at, at baling is, is huge. Um, with some of these crops, they get big at the time that we're harvesting, especially our sorghum sedans or maybe our forage sorghum. Uh, I was looking at some species of uh, or varieties rather of forage sorghum down at Fargo back this, this past summer. 
and it was well over 20 feet tall with some of the biofuel types, but huge plants. And when we're dealing with that amount of mass out there, it's difficult to get it to dry down. But the moisture that we have at baling is absolutely critical because we can lose dry matter content, we can lose quality within that bale if the moisture at baling is too high. Um, a good example of that is I had a, a county agent in southwestern North Dakota call me this, this past summer, and he had called, uh, he had a producer that had measured moisture content of a large round bale of sorghum Sudan grass that was, um, he had measured that moisture content about two or three days after they had baled it. The moisture content of that bale was 40%, 40% moisture. And he was asking me what to do about it. I, I, uh, my best advice was to call the fire department because he was going to have a major issue in, in another couple of days. So as a rule of thumb for our um, large round bales, we would like to get that moisture down to 15% at the time of baling. Generally, the larger those, those bale products are, the more dense they are, the drier that, that hay forage, that forage needs to be at the time that we roll it up into a bale. For our small square bales, it's gonna be a smaller package, uh, less density, generally. We can get by with a little bit higher moisture content at the time of baling, but we still need to pay attention. Forage species effect on quality. Uh, of course, our legumes are going to be the highest of our forage species in terms of nutrient content or quality. And during the summer, we're down here dealing with our tropical annual grasses or warm season annual grasses. And just by nature, they tend to, to be higher in fiber and a little bit lower in quality than, than some of our cool season species. So that's something to just kind of keep in mind that you're already dealing with, by nature, um, plants that are typically going to be a little bit lower in quality, higher in fiber. So the time of baling, that maturity point, that yield quality compromise is very important in terms of getting a quality product uh, baled up into your animal. Consider the cost of producing a, a low quality forage. Um, it's kind of a little bit different take on, on what Paul presented, but I, I chose a 1,300-pound cow that's 90 days post-calving. She's got a 25-pound um, peak milk production and uh, estimating dry matter intake of 28 pounds per day based on a 55% um, PDN or 55% NDF content. Our sorghum sedan grass that I showed you early at Vegetative can supply her 4.2 pounds per day of protein and a little over 18 pounds of TDN. This is our protein and TDN requirements here. So you can see that the sorghum sedan grass at Vegetative is meeting protein contents, but needs just a little bit of energy. I'm doing that with a DDD product for about 36 cents per day. When we move to a, to heading, my uh, dry matter intake is down to 24 pounds because my fiber content has gone from 55% to 65%. And also my protein and energy values have decreased. The same uh, requirements here for this cow, and I'm supplying quite a bit less in protein, quite a bit less in, in energy. And now instead of just fixing my energy, I also have to fix protein and energy, which is increasing my supplementation cost up quite a bit. So what are our options? I got curious the other day and went and looked up how many named grazing system types are out there that are actually published yeah, this is what I came up with. There's about 20 different types of named uh, grazing systems out there from MIG to the Savory to uh, uh, Harmony, all kinds of continuous mob grazing, all kinds of different grazing systems out there. 
And then we have all the species in here that we, we can utilize some of the cool seasons, the warm season the annuals, our cover crop species, a lot of things that once we considered not being a forage crop, they've been introduced through the cover crops. And now we've learned that we actually can take advantage of some of these uh, lesser known crops as forages. And this is one here, I know you guys in Oklahoma are very familiar with here in North Dakota, they don't know what I'm talking about when I mention okra, but okra uh, is a is an interesting cover crop species. It's a broad, broad leaf. It has a good taproot, good strong taproot uh, that can penetrate and help break up some of our uh, more compacted, heavier soil type. But also cattle consume this, this whole plant. They'll consume the leaves, they'll consume the pod. I don't know what kind of, uh, how it contributes to gain, but they do like it. Uh, which is which is kind of interesting. It's something that, that I learned doing some cover crop work. We Paul didn't mention the uh, the small grains. I'm just going to briefly mention this. Um, your window of opportunity there in Oklahoma may be closed. It might still be open if you can get on it fairly quickly. But this might be something to think about uh, for for next spring as well. This is spring cool season annual forage crop, uh, spring forage oats, spring forage barley, spring forage triticale. Um, most of the, our triticales are going to be uh, fall established or, or um, winter type triticales. Um, but there are very limited number of the spring forage types. There are spring forage oats. I think of these, the, the production potential is going to fall with the with the forage oats and the triticale. Uh, if you can find them, there is some seed availability uh, in Oklahoma for some of these. They're going to be northern types. But here's some of the the varietal names: Goliath, Hayden, Haymaker, uh, Haymaker Forage Barley, Merlin Max, uh, Spring Forage Triticale. Seeding rate on these, uh, 80 to a little over 100 pounds. If you're going to try and get a little grazing, I'd probably bump up, bump the seeding rate up a little bit. Um, some of the agronomics, I would full test prior to establishing these and account for any residual nitrogen that you may have because these are these will accumulate nitrates um, with the good with the right environmental conditions. They will accumulate nitrates especially the oats, they're absolutely notorious for doing that. Also, uh, oats will lodge if you push the nitrogen rates up on them uh, too high. Uh, they're a hollow stem plant. If you get this big seed head on them, they'll tend to fall over, which makes the uh, harvest a little bit difficult. I would uh, probably limit the nitrogen down to 25 to no more than 60 pounds of actual per acre. Your yield's going to be somewhere between one and three tons of dry matter per acre. Excellent forage quality in these. And as I mentioned, they are a nitrate accumulator. These can be grown alone, or you can add a legume to them. If you add a legume to them, I would eliminate the, the nitrogen application. Uh, forage peas work well. Um, cow peas will probably work well. Some of the, um, some of the uh, seed companies are often pre-mixed. Um, mixtures of, a, of about a 40% legume, or sorry, 60% legume, 40% uh, of these various cool season annuals already pre-mixed and ready to go. So something maybe to consider and think about. One, one thing, one consideration is that um, these are going to produce a, a crop fairly early, so you might have opportunities to do a little bit of double cropping uh, weather conditions are going to have to be pretty favorable favorable with that. Um, probably follow it up with a warm season annual of some sort. Warm season annual grasses, uh, the foxtail millets, not very popular in Oklahoma. You, you, you can uh, utilize them. They're going to be early. Um, somewhere as early as a, as a 55 day crop to a 70 day crop. Probably the most common one to find is, is German millet. 
Uh, these are relatively fine stemmed millets. They produce a lot of leaf area. Uh, tonnage is, is fairly good in terms of a hay crop because they do have that small stem. They're a little bit easier to handle than something like a pearl millet or the sorghum uh, forage types. Pearl millet, personally, I like pearl millet. Um, I've used it a lot in, in grazing work as, as my base forage uh, during the summer uh, as, a, as a warm season cover crop in between winter pasture crops. The BMR and dwarf crates are available in the pearl millet. Um, it works well combined with um, other cover crop types. I've, I've grown it with uh, cow peas. It works well with cow peas. Cattle like it. It's very palatable. Um, when we planted this in late May into June, it's really producing in August. It's really coming on August, late September. So think about that if you're if you're in a winter pasture system where you're trying to squeeze these in here in the summer, timing is pretty important. The earlier you can get these in the ground, the more grazing days you're going to have, the more opportunities for haying you're going to have, uh, and especially getting that crop out of the way for your sub subsequent winter pasture crop. One thing about the pearl millets is it doesn't like heavy black um, alkaline type soils. It doesn't like wet soils. It does tolerate uh, soil acidity, acidity better than the sorghums probably do. Uh, it fits our sandy soils real well. It does produce a really, it's a prolific tillering plant. It, it will produce a massive uh, root system underneath it, very massive. We'll move into the warm season annual grasses. Um, lots of choices here, the forage sorghums, the sorghum sedan hybrids, which are gonna be a cross between a forage sorghum and a sedan grass. Uh, the forage sorghums, uh, these, these are probably our tonnage kings. They're built mainly for, we'll see a lot of these that are built mainly for silage. Um, they're hard to deal with as a hay. They're gonna have a big stem, they're a big, massive crop. Typically, you're going to get one big harvest out of them. They, you do have some regrowth potential out of them. Um, not as popular in terms of haying as a sorghum sedan grass. The sorghum sedans really give us a lot of options. We can, we can put them up for silage. We can hay them. We can graze them. Uh, regrowth potential, I think, of these sorghum sedans is, is probably better than and we, we think, I do recommend, as Paul mentioned, if, you're, if you want regrowth uh, to leave at least a couple of nodes on that plant uh, when you harvest, so raise that cutter bar up. The other thing about raising that cutter bar up is um, you're probably, if you're concerned about nitrate accumulation, a lot of that occurs in the lower stems. So you're leaving some of that nitrates down on that stem. Uh, the other thing is that lower stem is going to add to yield, but it typically doesn't add a lot to quality. So by leaving a little bit of stem there, you're going to increase your potential for regrowth. Uh, as a rule, the sorghum, uh, sorghum sedan hybrids are going to yield a little bit less than uh, forage sorghum, but they're a little bit easier to cure out for hay. Um, my recommendation on, on that is to throw those windrows out as, as far as you possibly can. If you have a tether uh, that you can help, it will definitely help cure that hay out. The, the stems, crushing that stem will really help dry down and getting that moisture level down. Um, the problem is, is just the length of drying time with these warm season annual grasses. It, it's hard to get them dried down in a window that we don't get a little bit of rain on. Uh, it, it's just part of the bees, dealing with the bees. The sedan grass are a finer stem, uh, very excellent growth, uh, regrowth potential, good grazing potential. They do, they can accumulate prussic acid, they can accumulate nitrates, but they tend to have a little bit lower, lower prussic acid potential than the sorghum sedans or the forage sorghum. 
Uh, Paul mentioned this, they, they do have nitrate potential as well. Um, there are lines of the Thorium sedan hybrids coming out that have um, low or no prussic acid potential accumulation on the way. Uh, that those products have been licensed to a seed company now. I don't think they're on the market, but I'm kind of looking forward to those coming on the market and giving us a, a, a really nice sorghum sedan, um, lower prussic acid potential. Tons of traits available in these. Uh, the forage sorghums, you can get a brown midrib. You can have photosensitive, photosensitive types. Male sterile types, dwarf types, dry stalk types, uh, same in the sorghum sedan hybrids, pearl bullets, we can have a, a BMR trait or a dwarfism trait, sedan grass, a BMR or, or a, a dwarf type. I'm, I'm curious about the, the dwarf types. Um, the leaf to stem ratio is very much improved in these dwarf types. So I, I think the quality is going to be there. The internode length between the between the leaves has been reduced, so you should have higher quality. May take a little bit of hit on a yield there, but um, the quality should be improved on these. The BMR types, you'll see BMR six, BMR twelve, BMR eighteen. These are the more common BNR um, mutants that you will see out there. Most commonly, you'll see a BMR6 or a BMR12. The 12 tends to be a little bit higher yielding than the 6 and a little higher NDFD, which is, that's a good thing. I did a little study here this, this past summer and kind of what I wanted to do was just kind of look at differences between um, um, forage types that had traits versus forage types that did not have traits. So here is a sedan grass that we had the BMR and the dwarf, um, one that didn't. So you can kind of see how I set this up. And um, these were planted in late June. I see them all at 15 pounds. We put some starter fertilizer on. And what's interesting about this particular study is that after we got this established, uh, we had uh, a broadleaf plant, kosha, that came in and just really swamped these plants. So we mowed all the plants trying to get ahead of the kosha. I felt like this study was probably all over, but we had some uh, favorable moisture conditions. And it actually, the, the study actually regrew, regrew rather. So none of these got any additional fertilizer. And we got really, Pretty darn good yields. These, these were taken in October. Here's our, our BMR type down here in terms of yield. We didn't get the yield. And, and Paul made a very good point about uh, harvesting at optimal maturity versus a date. So these were all harvested at the same point in time. And there's differences in plant maturity here between these between these groups, but fairly similar, a lot are fairly similar in yield. And you look at nutrient content of these plants, the BMRs did kind of, did tend to rise toward the top in terms of quality. So very, very similar, very similar to the results that Paul was showing earlier. Establishment considerations. There's been a lot of talk about the cover crops and cover crop mixtures. Can you seed these as a mixture? Yeah, you sure can. And there is all kinds of combinations of different uh, broadleaf plants, legumes, brassicas that you can mix in with these, these uh, various crops. They're already pre-mixed and available through the seed companies. So you can take a look at those. Keep in mind, though, that, that some of these mixtures may actually, may actually complicate your hay drying process. So it's a little easier to manage a monoculture for a hay uh, just because you can manage the maturity, you can manage the drying and, and hay curing process a little bit easier. Another thing to think about is just the cost of those mixtures versus a monoculture. Uh, some of the anti-quality considerations, just from the nitrate concerns, 
the small grains typically are, are a little bit higher in their mm, ability to accumulate nitrates, followed by the brassicas and the, the warm season annuals. Prussic acid potential, uh, highest in the grain sorghum, followed by the forage sorghum, sorghum sedan grass, and then sedan grass. The, the prussic acid potential is going to dissipate with forage drying, so we typically are not too concerned about it in a, in a well dried hay product. It can also decrease with silages. That's not the, not the same with a nitrate accumulation. Whoops. Another thing to keep in mind is how is the area that you're going to plant these annuals on been prepared? So sometimes we run into cases where we may have a, a crop failure and then we're coming behind it with, with an emergency forage or something that that we're planting it for a short season crop, take into consideration how that ground area has been prepared. If any pre-emerged herbicides have been put down, um, make sure that you read that label that it's not going to interfere with whatever it is that you're going to be planting. Um, I had that case happen here where we we uh, a pre-emerge was applied. My sorghum sedans tolerated it. It knocked out all my millet. So something to think about. Also think about just seed availability and cost. Nitrate management, um, I think Paul hit this pretty well. Uh, raise that cutter bar, bar height up if you do think you, that you have uh, potential for nitrates. You can always test for nitrates as well. If you get that test back uh, and you do have higher nitrate levels, it's, sometimes it's sometimes it might be the end of the world, but many times you can blend those forages with something else to kind of dilute that effect. So keep that in mind. Uh, for the foxtail millets, they're not a, a, a forage for horses. It can cause some problems uh, there with um, with the foxtail millet, millets and horses. And just a final thought, dealing with dry weather is, is tough. I think we all know that. We've all lived through that. I had a producer uh, a few years ago that he called me. We were in a drought period, and, and he wanted to know, well, what I thought about planting a crop during it during this time period of drought. So uh, I kicked in all my extension knowledge about everything that that could go wrong with planting uh, during a dry period. And he sat there and he listened to me for a while. And he finally said, you know, nothing is going to happen unless I put seed in the ground. And lesson learned with that. What he was trying to say is, I have the option of doing something or I have the option of not doing anything. And the worst thing I could do is not do anything. So he planted. Consider also uh, your time. Time is important for prep time, getting the seed in place, doing your soil test, checking your herbicides, um, all of those things that you need to do to get that crop and have a successful crop in the ground. Planning, get the sorghums in early. Uh, this, will make, this will give you more management options. I think the earlier you can go in, the more options you're gonna have. Typically in Oklahoma, you're gonna you're gonna have a period now where you may have some uh, a wet time period. And then when we roll into the summer, it's gonna get hot and dry. So if I can get that crop in, get it going early, take advantage of the moisture that I do have coming out of the winter, and I may have during uh, early spring, the better off I'm gonna be. It might also give you some options in terms of taking an early hay crop or that first crop off as hay. If you manage it right. Uh, Get some rainfall later, the regrowth, you might be able to uh, graze that regrowth as well. This is another old saying uh, in terms of getting your crabgrass out. This came from a, a longtime specialist at, at Noble. If you know him, you probably can figure out this quote. Crabgrass should be established when the leaves on the oak tree are as big as the squirrels here, which is probably right now. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much, <clears throat> James. We've got a few questions that um, from the chat. 
um, and one one in the Q and A. Just so Brian Fricking asked, "What is the target soil temperature for planting these warm season annuals?" Sixty degrees and rising. Does that depend on depth or just soil at what depth? Uh, probably at the planting depth. So two inch, three inch. So uh, Steve Mosier asked, I am located in the Arkansas River Valley. I have a small paddock that fed hay in over the winter. It's very well cultivated do the cow tracking over the winter. What would you suggest planting and how much per acre? I probably could not drill, but I can drag it. Uh, who's he asking that to? I'm gonna say it was just asked to everyone, so. What was his, what was his question again? He's got a uh, sacrifice paddock where he fed hay. It's pretty well tracked up. Uh, what kind of cover should be broadcast over that if he can broadcast but not drill in the Arkansas River Valley? You know, since since he since he fed hay there, I wonder what would happen if he just drug it, smoothed it back out, and just let it go. Maybe throw some crabgrass out there. It's probably going to come on. Oh, that's what I was thinking, Jane. Boy, crabgrass would work good in that situation. By the way, doesn't the Arkansas River Valley cover a lot of different states? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's true. Not, not sure what his conditions are. Maybe he's in Arkansas. We, we, we broadcast crabgrass all of that research project we did uh, several years ago, uh, three years in a row. and. We, of course, you know, there would have been residual soil uh, seed available, but still, we just had tremendous response. Obviously, we didn't have the moisture. Steve said he's in Russellville, Arkansas. Um, there, there's probably a lot of volunteer that could come out of the, the hay feeding area. Um, May be an issue with pigweed for sure, uh, but there could be a lot of broadleaf signal grass. And like you say, the, the crabgrass would be a, a great uh, uh, that that area. Also, I would I would think it would probably flush the Johnson grass too. Um, I don't know if he wants that or not, but it would probably come on. Well, thank you very much, James. That was a great presentation. We've got these recorded and they'll be posted uh, with probably early next week. Um, with that, it, um, we I don't see any other questions. So uh, Dr. Beggs, Dr. Lawman, do you have anything to add? No, just a re just a reminder. We have a number of extension events that are are coming up in uh, in short order. Uh, in particular, next week uh, on April sixth, the McLean County Expo Center has uh, that's there at Purcell. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's the Oklahoma Beef Cattle Summit uh, coming coming up next week. We also have our Fed Cattle Field Day coming up April twenty seventh, right here in in Stillwater. And that's in conjunction with Oklahoma Cattlemen's uh, Foundation. And uh, we have a variety of others, ranch tour coming up uh, May 11th and 12th. And so uh, with that, if you're looking for any of that information, we're happy to provide that. As always, check beef.okstate.edu for our recordings, as well as a uh, widespread of other resources. Dr. Lawman, did you have anything to add? Bob Good, appreciate the great turnout today and look forward to seeing most of you next week.
All right, as a reminder, next week, we will have James Henderson from the Bradley Three Ranch, as well as Dr. Mark Johnson from right here at OSU Animal Science, speaking again on selecting cattle for productivity and longevity uh, in, in unfortunately tough conditions that we're continuing on with. So I uh, wanna thank Dr. Rogers and Dr. Beck, of course, for excellent presentations today. Thank you so much for being with us and the insight uh, as we look, look forward and, and now is the time to start thinking about how we're going to deal with current drought and future drought. Good decisions, uh, timely decisions are probably warranted uh, at, at the moment. So with that, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll hang on just a minute or two if you have any questions. And otherwise, we will see you again next week. Thanks again, everybody, for attending. And James, I really appreciate you coming on with us. Thanks. I, I enjoyed it. It's great.